This podcast is sponsored by Lightens. Lightens, your best source for OE quality automotive and heavy duty accessory drive tensioning devices. We know tensioners because we invented them. Paul, welcome to AMN Drive Time, sponsored by Lightens. Nice to be with you, Bill, and uh, very honored. Really enjoyed these these Drive Time uh, podcasts that you've done. Great, glad to have you here. So, so Paul, you have an extensive automotive background. Tell us how you came to be involved in the aftermarket and eventually to lead AASA. Well, you know, for me, I think like many in the aftermarket, it feels like we've been in the aftermarket our whole life. You know, for me, it started young. Um, I think of it that I really started in the aftermarket and my grandpa let me um, give him his tools as he was working on the cars, kind of like a nurse to a doctor. And this was a big deal for me because my grandpa took this stuff very seriously. He was a maintenance foreman at a steel mill. You know, his tools were meticulous. And so it was a big deal as a kid to be able to be part of that. And I still think of him a lot um, when I work in the industry. And so I think for me, it started, the aftermarket started, like so many in the industry, with, with family and with a wrench. Um, now, professionally, I've been in the auto industry for over a quarter century. And uh, before joining ASA and MEMA, my previous role for many years was I headed the automotive and industrial product strategy practice at PwC, at PricewaterhouseCoopers. And so I worked a lot in the aftermarket. Uh, I worked around the world, um, but it is a little dirty secret in my resume that I also worked on the heavy duty side. I worked on the OE side, but I chose the aftermarket. And my team has heard this story so much um, and they're kind of tired of hearing it. But I like to say that, you know, the OE guys, they have some cool products. Heavy duty really knows how to make money, but the aftermarket has the best people. And that's why, you know, it was no contest. For me, I chose the aftermarket. Terrific. So you, you mentioned you uh, helped your grandfather fix cars. What was your first real job when you graduated from high school or in high school or college, but your first <laughs> so-called real paying job? Real paying job? Um, it was actually crewing on a, uh, a tall ship. So I was living in high school in a small town in Delaware. And uh, we had this, I think it was an 80 foot schooner that would take tourists out into the ocean and to see things. And so I was crew on it. And my role was to, among other things, I'd climb up the mast and then I'd shimmy out on the yard arms and I would hang upside down and, uh, and get the topsails up. And so I was really entertainment for the tourists. You know, I was out there hanging upside down over the water sort of like a trained monkey making them ooh and ah and, 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 uh, and be impressed. Um, I will say as soon as the captain found out that I also liked cars, uh, we did have a diesel engine to help the, the sailboat um, as it got into dock and such. So I got put in charge of maintenance of that as well among my other jobs. That's my first job. I hope you got some good tips going up on that, uh, fixing those sails, Paul. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually not a great sailor. I do enjoy it. I'm a good crew, and I'm good at uh, getting the beers. So, Paul, you are always a very poised and seemingly natural speaker at industry events. You seem very comfortable up on the stage. What's your secret? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a nice thing to say, Bill. I, I appreciate that. It's very kind. Um, the only answer I can think of is that I care what I'm talking about. You know, it's much easier to talk about something that you care about than it is to say, talk about yourself in a format like this. And so my great blessing is that I get to work on behalf of the industry. I get to work on behalf of all of you. And this is an industry I'm passionate about, passionate about. Uh, it's a role I take very seriously. The downside, of course, is that I have thousands of bosses. The upside is that I have real purpose in my work and your listeners are that purpose. And it's very motivating for us to try as a team here at ASA to champion the aftermarket industry, to support the aftermarket supplier community. So I know I'm very blessed 
to get to serve in this role. Paul, you mentioned it just a moment ago about how great the people are in the aftermarket. And I think that's just a general theme for all of us who are involved in the aftermarket. Do you have any memorable words of wisdoms or mentors in the aftermarket who have really mm -hmm. made an impression on you, who have given you great guidance or counsel or helped you in any number of ways? I know, of course, that uh, you've worked closely with Bill Long for a number of years. And mm -hmm. I'm just curious who some of those folks may be in your in your world. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, Bill. And it's one I've enjoyed listening to on some of your other uh, drive time podcast. But this really is, as you say, this is a people industry. This is a relationship industry. So when I think about some of those folks, first and foremost, as you say, Bill Long, who's been a tremendous friend and mentor. Um, just sticking to ASA and MEMA, of course, Steve Hanchu, Bob McKenna, uh, Charlie Johnson, who's a longtime MEMA board member, has been a great mentor to me. And I've been lucky in my role over the years to get to work with the AA. AASA board members. They're a tremendous set of leaders and they provided me with guidance and mentorship um, over the years. I'm trying to think of some of the names. Uh, Jeff Brecky of Gates, who was one of our former chairs, Joe Pomeranski, uh, Jay Burkhard, Keith Wilson, uh, Mark Blackman. Uh, he's from outside our board, but John Passante, and I, I could go on and on. There's just such a great pool of leaders I've had access to on the mentor front and not just on the manufacturer side, the customer side as well. You know, John Washbish, Larry Pavey, they've given me invaluable guidance over the years. Um, saying all these names just make me think of the names that I haven't mentioned that I probably should have. And I think it comes back to what you said. This is the best industry to be in because of the people. And I've been blessed. And Again, I've, I've heard you ask this question, it's such a great one. And if I can broaden it a little, this is such an important topic, this mentorship thing. It's one of the reasons I'm so excited about our mix young leaders group um, and about our industry as it tries to achieve its DEI goals. We need these kind of mentors. Like I've been able to enjoy, like so many in the industry, uh, for these folks who are coming in, for our industry to get the best talent, to take those folks to the next level, I think we need to commit to being that kind of mentor for our next set of leaders. Like those names I said, um, they're how I got here. And I'm very grateful and thankful for that. And I think all of us need to give back in the same way. Speaking of great leaders, Paul, you and Bill Hanvey were honored, uh, not the most recent, AWDA Person of the Year, but Leader of the Year, but the year before. It's hard to keep track of these last two years. It seems like a year, but it's really been two, right? 20 and 21 sort of meshed into one year. Anyways, the, the unprecedented challenges that the two of you faced during the pandemic started in March of 20, and you triumphed over. In the past year during the pandemic, Right to Repair, pivoting Apex to a virtual show, earning a central business status for the industry, mm -hmm. you must feel ready for anything and everything at this point. What do you, what do you got your eyes on? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, first, I do have to mention what an incredible honor and how humbling it was um, to win that award. And it was great and, uh, and such an honor to win it with my friend Bill Hanby together. Uh, really meant a lot. It does remind me we are servants in this role. We have to be leaders, but in the end, we are servant leaders for the industry. Um, but you ask what's next. And for us, it's pretty simple because our priorities are whatever our member priorities are. And those tend to fall into two buckets. The first is the current, the, you know, the burning platforms we need to address. And the second is the long term. What do we need to do to advance our vision, which is an ever more successful aftermarket industry and aftermarket supplier community. But as you were just saying, Bill, the current ones, there's just so many. This is all blurring together, all this uncertainty, all this challenge. And we've done our best to help our members through. You mentioned being identified as uh, essential. All these COVID disruptions, we did a whole series of COVID webinars. This year or last year, uh, we did a whole six-part series on supply chain and all the disruption that was creating 
helping our members benchmark and understand and learn and, and improve. Um, we recently done all these things about the COVID mandates, all the HR issues that we're facing as we try to attract and retain people in these crazy circumstances. Um, another near-term thing I have to mention is it's pretty amazing what our industry has achieved in terms of getting parts to customers right now. Nobody's happy with where fill rates are at, but in our most recent barometer, it was impressive how things have improved on that front. Because as we go into 2022, we're starting to see some little improvements here and there around supply chain. But when we did the last survey, we hadn't seen an improvement in any of the incoming you know, parts, um, materials, shipping that we needed, but we had seen a significant improvement in fill rates. And that that's really extraordinary. It speaks to the ingenuity of suppliers and the whole aftermarket. Another thing it speaks to is the improvement in collaboration that we had up and down the value chain that made that happen. So I just wanted to call that out because it's a pretty cool thing that the industry has achieved and it speaks uh, to that relationship, that collaboration element. Um, longer term, what's next? First and foremost has to be right to repair. That's to ensure that we have a future for the aftermarket. So we need to win, defend these principles of competition, free markets, consumer choice that are behind not just our industry, but really our American system. And I'd be glad to talk more about that. Um, but the other aspect is these technology changes. You know, there's a lot of talk about the changes in vehicle technology. And it's certainly true, electrification, ADOS, we think is even more of a near-term opportunity. But even bigger is some of the shifts in business technology, in this revolution we're seeing in terms of, it's technology-driven, but it's really a consumer convenience revolution. And that's changing, you know, we've seen it with e-commerce and um, really multi-channel, we're seeing a change how we distribute items. We're change, seeing changes in consumer expectations. Um, and that shift, helping our members successfully navigate the shifts this technology are bringing to our vehicles, to our markets. Um, I think that's a big role of us. I think it's what we're really focused on. And when our members can see past all these individual challenges, that's what they're focused on, seeing that road ahead. I will say it's a lot of change, but it's not something we should be afraid of. We think there's a lot of opportunity for the entrepreneurial aftermarket in that we think the aftermarket is responding and without change it's one of those economics 101 things without change you don't have profit we think there's going to be a lot of profit and innovation and uh, that the aftermarket is going to show coming out of this we are entrepreneurs and it's never a good thing to bet against the american entrepreneur paul what are your thoughts on the current Biden uh, administration as it relates to policies and changes that could potentially impact AASA members? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great question because the government seems to be playing a bigger role and it doesn't seem like that's going away. I've had several member CEOs tell me recently that the government seems to have more impact on the success of aftermarket businesses. And this is going back, not just this administration, but uh, the previous one as well, than it ever has in their lifetimes. And even outside of that long-term issue of right to repair, which is so important, you know, the way it used to be in our industry is that we like the government to be as far away as possible and allow us to be entrepreneurs. But that is just not the world we live in. And we need to accept it. And I think what we've learned is when it comes to this government stuff, either we need to lead and make sure our voice is heard, or we're just going to have it happen to us. And so we need to fight for what helps our industry grow. And it's a real long laundry list. I mean, obviously, long term, the priority is right to repair. But just some of the near term advocacy, we had the essential businesses issue you mentioned, uh, the ports recently getting increasing hours and cutting some of the red tape, increasing regulatory costs. You know, just ask our chemicals members or our break members about all the things they're facing now and what they need to be ahead of. We've had the trade issues, we've had taxes, uh, any counterfeiting. There's several bills that are out there now to protect our members. So the good news is I think we and, and other associations in the industry, we've been able to achieve a respect that we've never had before in Washington. I think 
there they understand better how important our industry is, both as manufacturers and as the aftermarket as a whole. Um, and you see it in the tremendous meetings and access we've had, you know, talking to the Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of Transportation. We had multiple meetings with Vice President Pence when we we're dealing with the trade issues. You know, dozens and dozens of members of Congress we speak to regularly. We have a seat at the table we've never had before. Unfortunately, we also have a greater need for that seat and for that voice. And, uh, and that's a challenge. I'm not sure it's, it's natural for us in the aftermarket to be thinking that way, but this is our reality. So, Paul, I think it's sort of kind of related to that. What's your take on EVs today? Is the aftermarket industry ready? If not, when should it be? In general, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts as it relates to EV? Yeah. That is kind of the million dollar question. And it's interesting. You go back year, two, three. I think the tone in the industry around EVs was fear. And our view is it shouldn't be. So the first good news is we're the aftermarket. We have time to adjust. At the same time, we obviously can't deny this trend. We can't be ostriches, put our heads in the sand. So as you know, you know, we did a big study last spring and then at Apex, um, we partnered with our friends at AutoCare and we released this new study. We extended and broadened what we had done and created this great joint study to sort of an authoritative industry view of what to expect out to 2045 on this issue. And the findings are that we do have time to adjust. Out to 2035, even 2045, the vast majority of the products, the repair and maintenance parts that will be sold will be the products that we already know and sell. You just think about the math. We have over 280 million vehicles in operation in the US. The average age is over 12 years old. We are that proverbial big ship that is slow to turn, going back to my first job. And, uh, and it just takes a while uh, to turn. Uh, by the way, another big finding is that yes, counter to some fears, the aftermarket will continue to grow out to 2045 and beyond. At the same time, we can't ignore the fact electrification grows. It creates new products too. So electrification, and I also throw out ADOS, driver assist, you look out to 2030, 2035, a large share of the growth, not a large share of the market, but a significant share of the growth comes from these new technologies and new products. So what we're telling members, if you want to grow at the pace of the market, particularly in certain regions of the country, again, we can't be ostriches and put our heads in the sand. We need to innovate. And we do think the entrepreneurial aftermarket is responding. You know, we may be in a Goldilocks scenario again, countering that fear in that we have plenty of time to sell our existing products and maximize that ROI, but also plenty of time to innovate, take advantage of these growth opportunities that we think technology will bring. So we don't think we need to be scared of the future. Um, it's only a concern if you don't plan for the future. If we forget all of that customer centricity, all that entrepreneurship that has gotten us where we are and has made the aftermarket so successful. Paul, I want to circle back to, to right to repair. You've mentioned it a couple of times, but I want to circle yeah. back because it's obviously an important issue. Uh, the Car Coalition recently announced a multi-million dollar national education and mobilization campaign in both Biden's executive order on competition and the FDC's Nixing the Fix report seemed to have added substantial momentum for the cause. Yes. What are your thoughts on where we stand? And again, you've touched on it, but I just think it's worth yeah. going back and just uh, hearing some more comments from you. Well, thanks. It is an important issue. This is the future of our industry. And you're right. We're seeing some very significant momentum. We saw over the last year, we're not tilt tilting at windmills, as they say, in talking about this. So the president said that we're on the right side of this issue. More impressively, as you said, the Federal Trade Commission. They voted unanimously on a bipartisan basis to say this is anti-competitive, that they agree with what we're saying. They've also said this is a key priority, repair restrictions for them in 2022. I'd also throw out one of the biggest momentums we have in, in talking about this to people on Capitol Hill is that Congress is already hearing about repair from their constituents. Right now, it's because of some of the shortages that we've seen. 
And I think um, people complaining, hey, I may not be able to get my re vehicle repaired easily. That highlights the importance of the aftermarket to the, the lives and the livelihoods of our industry. But now imagine, Bill, we're a few years out and at risk is the 75% of the repair capacity that is the independent aftermarket. Congress will hear the biggest outcry from their constituents they've ever had. So now is clearly the right time for Congress to support the voters and their constituents on this issue. And so a big deal is that soon we will have federal legislation, the uh, Repair Act. We think this is critical for not just our industry, but for consumers. And we at AASA and our partners at AutoCare have really been spearheading this effort. We've also partnered with, uh, as you note, and have the support of the Car Collision Coalition. Uh, SEMA is also a supporter. And this is the most important federal effort by the aftermarket in half a century since we had the Magnuson Moss Act. And we need to rally now like we did then. Did then. We are living history and now is the time to be heard. Um, one other right to repair thing I wanted to mention is that we have formed an industry governance body with our partners at AutoCare and ETI. So this is an institution to ensure that we have safe and secure repair access. It's designed to be future-proof. It's designed to be cooperative across our industry. Because um, again, we must do this to defend these principles behind not just our industry, but the American way. So right to repair. It's very far from one, but we're making progress. And I think 2022 and 2023 will prove to be the turning point, the most important years as to whether we do win this, we do retain consumer choice and competition and repair for decades to come, which we should and we must. So Paul, Apex 21 recently wrapped up. It was in my opinion, great to see everyone face to face. Would love to hear two things. Number one, your post show impressions of 2021 and any thoughts you may have about 2022, although it's still oh, mm -hmm. many months away. Well, first, I'm glad to hear that uh, you enjoyed getting to see everybody. I did too. And I have to say the show exceeded all expectations. I heard so much positivity when I was there. Um, what I heard from attendees was, you know, they had extremely high quality meetings, very valuable meetings. I can give you a couple of examples. Um, I heard from several members that they made more progress on dealing with these supply chain issues and on those discussions than they had, you know, in six or nine months, just doing it face to face and get to the heart of the matter. Um, Spoke to one member who said, listen, we weren't hitting budget when we came into Apex. We left Apex blowing away our budget. So I think we've all learned we have these great new technology tools, but there's no substitute for in-person, not in this relationship industry. So what I've heard from a lot of members, you talked about 2022, is that going forward, we're going to have fewer, bigger in-person events. We're going to have a lot less travel. We're going to have more virtual but that means that some of the key face-to-face -face discussions, they may be saved up for Apex. And that Apex in our more virtual, less travel future, it may be more important post-pandemic than it was before. And uh, that leads me to have an awful lot of excitement about 2022. I think people want to come together. Um, I think we're going to have a whole new set of challenges. If there's anything we've learned is there's going to be some surprises in 2022. And the only way we solve things is working together, having that communication, that collaboration, that innovation up and down the supply chain. And that's the value of Apex is making that happen and helping all of us be more successful and make more money. So it'll be nice to be back, fingers crossed, healthier, bigger, um, better, more international again. Um, but we had a great show in 2021, so it's hard not to be positive about 2020. So, Paul, one final question for you. Uh, we've been talking a lot of business uh, issues. What do you like to do for fun? Any, lo any hobbies or secret talents that would surprise us and you'd like to share with the AMN audience? Um, I think I'm kind of unsurprising. You know, I like to spend time with my family. That's the biggest one. I, I do love everything auto-related, cars, 
old cars, new cars. I spend way too much time on that. My family gets sick of hearing me talk about it. Um, I like to hike, read, barbecue. Um, something surprising. Well, there's one thing that sometimes surprises my team, and that's that I've traveled to 59 countries. I love uh, exploring and learning. Now, I haven't added any countries to that list in quite a few years now, um, especially with the pandemic. But uh, I do love, I go to these countries and then I bore my family talking about all the different cars I see and going, I go to shops in different places and see how it's different. Drives them crazy, but I love it. So uh, I'm definitely looking forward to getting back to working globally and uh, when we're past this pandemic. I think we're all a little bit sick of this and, uh, and, and looking forward to being business as usual. Paul, it's been great to have you on AMN Drive Time, sponsored by Lightens. Thanks so much for spending time with us. Well, thanks for having me. I do really enjoy listening to these podcasts and, and learning from, from everybody in the industry. This podcast is sponsored by Lightens. Lightens, your best source for OE quality automotive and heavy duty accessory drive tensioning devices. We know tensioners because we invented them.